Hello there, good afternoon. Welcome to the CTO series with me, Matthew Quinn from Silicon Brighton. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Emmanuel Ayad, uh, a local uh, technology and engineering leader from Brighton. Um, this will be the first in the series of uh, our CTO series, which is our uh, weekly chats with technology leaders from Brighton uh, to share their experiences, their knowledge, um, and ideas with, with you, our Silicon Brighton community. Uh, so first up, as I mentioned, is Emmanuel, who's worked for a number of Brighton-based businesses as heads of technology and CTO before moving to Curio, Curio Labs in London, uh, where he's uh, scaled the team and uh, managed the technology side of the business, taking them through to uh, a Series A funding round recently. Um, Emmanuel, thanks for joining us. Um, if I could just have a brief introduction from you regarding uh, yourself, uh, Kiro Labs, and the, and the journey that you've been on uh, there uh, to date, um, that'd be great. Sure. Um, okay, so I joined uh, Kiro about two and a half years ago. Uh, the the company has had just raised uh, a seed funding, a round of uh, first round of funding, and I was the first employee. So the technology was there, um, but the ambition was then to find, we would call a market fit. So we had a few people who okay. liked the product, uh, and uh, we had to demonstrate that we could scale that up, and uh, that's this, this appetite for the people, for the, for the product could be, could be scaled up. So when I joined, um, I mean, the first... Uh, aspect of my role was to assess where we were. So you land in a in a company, your first employee, you've got everything on your shoulders in terms of you know what is technology. But um, what we really started focusing on at the very beginning was um, branding. So we looked at the brand. What is it? What is Curio? What we are saying to uh, our users. And that's super important yep. because as we were preparing to start hiring people, uh, that message needed to be consistent with uh, uh, the culture internally as well. So we did a lot of work on branding um, and on culture. So how defining our values. Uh, and that led nicely to then the second stage, which was, okay, well, let's look at the technology we have in place. Uh, and let's look at the people we need to hire to be able to start scaling. Um, so in the first year, the work, most of the work was to hire the right people, uh, to put yeah. the right team in place, a product team in place, and to uh, revamp the technology to facilitate development and communication around this uh, team growing. Um, so we moved, uh, we started moving away from a monolith application and started building services to speed up, to speed up development and, and really facilitate communication about the development we were making. So that took us about a year, a year and a half before we started embarking into the next stage, which was to raise a second round of investment with uh, different ambitions. Once you have, um, demonstrated that you've got a market fit, then it is all about being able to scale up. So we recently uh, raised the second round and now the, the role has shifted and my focus is more about uh, looking into helping making decisions, uh, more data-driven decisions and also um, keeping everything ticking so that we can grow both the technology, the spend in terms of marketing, but also uh, uh, the people so that uh, we, can, we, we, can, we can grow the diff different teams all together. Yeah, absolutely. 
So how, how big was the company when when you joined as a CTO? How many people were um, already there? So uh, it was the, um, the two founders, Shrikant and Govind, and a contractor who was uh, maintaining uh, the current app. So they built the kind of minimum viable product. Was it released at that It was point, released. Or? It was doing pretty well. Uh, we yeah. used a technology, um, a hybrid technology, so you can build basically in one source code uh, an app for Android for yeah. iOS and for the web. So it, yeah. it was pretty nifty right. already. Would that be, is something like React Native? Is that kind of yeah, very similar. It was called Ionic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, fine. So at that stage, joining as a, as a CTO, having the product which works and was you know, built to a, to a good standard, what then is your, is your next key hire uh, to, to help drive so, that forward? Uh, yeah, that's a good question because you start thinking, okay, who do I hire? And then you need to champion that. You need to make basically uh, it clear what kind of people you need to hire and what they will be doing. Because if you join, as I did, as first person, first employee, you there's a good chance that you are hands-on as well. So I was doing development. Um, so the first, we knew the type of people we wanted to bring on board, the type of people who will enjoy working at Curio. There was a lot of groundwork done in that respect. So in terms of profiling and in terms of uh, uh, knowing who we were after, uh, we had a, a pretty good uh, idea about it. So that was, and that's a lot of, uh, that's most of the work because once you know who you want to go after, then you just uh, uh, reach out to your network to, um, uh, uh, and you just hire the, the, the right person for the job. So for us, the right person for the job was someone who could start scaling up the iOS app. We identified that uh, most of our market, uh, our target was iOS. Uh, more so than the Android yep. or the web. Um, so it was critical for us to speed up development for the iOS app, and we hired an uh, iOS developer with the expertise uh, in, that, in this area, in this domain, to help us rebuild the app as a native app and to make it uh, uh, yep. a best-class app to uh, be able to, um, to scale up. Okay. Fine, exactly. So you, you, you've already identified where your uh, the, the largest portion of your target audience is, you know, iPhone users, and to focus on getting that right. And I guess then you can replicate the success in that market in other areas once yeah. you've once you've sort of proved that blueprint. Yes. I guess, yeah. So in terms of um, so that makes sense in terms of the market. But what considerations are you giving to architecture and design, given that? you've got those plans to scale. So how do you then, I guess, choose some of the more uh, intricate parts of architecture and design with scale in uh, mind? Yeah, so I think architecture and communication are tightly coupled. Um, so, and as you grow, communication evolves. So the technology and communication work together. So at the beginning, you when you build an MVP or a small product, you end up making choices very often uh, uh, towards uh, a monolith kind of architecture. So, so if you've got one developer, if you are working yourself on, on the product, when you talk about it, you probably talk about the whole product as a whole, back end, front end, uh, uh, et cetera. So that communication yeah. is reflected in the architecture. So the, the architecture is kind of monolith. Yeah. But as you start hiring more uh, specialization, then that communication start changing and uh, the you need to be prepared to get the architecture evolving in that respect. So that's uh, you always have a good match between communication and technology and none of them drive the other. You've got communication feeding into technology and technology feeding back into communication. So you just need to read the signs, hire, grow the team, but as you hire, identify the steps where communications communication evolves and then you need to make sure that the architecture evolves as well. So um, for us at the moment, there was really three stages. So when I joined, it was monolith. Then we started specializing. So mm -hmm. we started promoting uh, um, the development of services. And uh, now that yep. data is, um, is, is, is an increased focus and we 
we tend to talk about data more in, in, a, in isolation than we've started building a data infrastructure separately from application infrastructure. Yeah. So um, yeah, good alignment between communication and, and architecture is, a, is a critical. And uh, in parallel to that, um, well, managing the technical debt, I think at this stage, it is super important to keep an eye on it. So to keep the technical debt as low as possible, but that you also need to make sure that the organi organizational debt is kept uh, uh, low as well. So in the same way, technology and uh, communication work together, any changes you make in terms of, or any decision you make in terms of limiting the technical debt, you need to make sure that culturally, when you grow, uh, the organization is, is, is keeping the pace with the culture you're putting in place for this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of, um, I guess, you need to have that foresight as to, you know, where we're looking to take this product, what will that mean to the technology landscape in two, three, four years, and, and sort of keep that in mind as you evolve, I imagine? Uh, yes, that's, that's definitely something you need to keep an eye on. So for us, the domain is, uh, is, uh, is quite narrow. We've got apps with uh, different platforms. We've got still a big focus on iOS right now, but we are starting uh, looking into web and, and, and Android. So that's keeping, yes, we, we are keeping in very close relationship with Apple, for example. Um, but uh, but yeah. but yes, we, we keep, yeah, it's important to to keep an eye on all the new developments. There is new disruption happening all the time, so yes, keeping up with that is very important. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, I guess my next question would be, when scaling those teams, and I think you alluded to some of these points earlier. Um, but what are the key considerations that you would give? Whether that's to a character profile or to um, you know the makeup of the team in general, when building engineering departments and product and data teams, what are the key things that are most important for you as a leader to identify in those teams? Um, so we are agile. I mean, there is a strong focus on, on agile and lean, uh, but not only at engineering level or product level. Um, that needs to be done across the board. So as we hire people. Uh, there is, uh, you know, we, we try to identify all the traits which make someone very uh, receptive to agile or with experience having worked in an agile environment, but also making yeah. sure that then the, uh, the decision making process is shared across the company. So when we hire people, um, we make sure that they fit into the overall culture for the company. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, and then um, from that um, perspective, I guess um, agility is important, particularly within a young startup that's, uh, you know, where change and, and, and things are fast paced. Um, how do you build that in, how do you build that out agile culture sustainably? How do you make sure that's something that people are bought into to, you know, provide longevity and so on? Yeah, so I guess you learn about agile in doing it. It is very difficult to champion agile just uh, as a matter of principle. So mm -hmm. um, what I found very important was to keep delivering value. Uh, that's one aspect of it. So keeping, keep delivering business value and be super opinionated and super vocal if uh, anyone working on the team has got any reservation in terms of what value they are bringing to the team and to the so that's super important for facilitating this communication across the board about the value of it. Mm -hmm. um, but also champion agile all the time and be ready to be challenged on that. I think that's uh, a mm -hmm. big part of the job. Uh, agile, I mean, the last thing you want is to have agile coming across as being doctrinal or you're trying to put things in place which are uh, sectarian. Um, so that's a, that's a lot of work required to communicate about the values of, of Agile, not trying to approach Agile as uh, upside down. So there is uh, this uh, reference of the Agile onion. So you start with uh, the principles, the values, and you go down to uh, the tools. So yeah, don't start with the tools, start with making sure that these values and the principles of Agile are shared across the board and 
keep reinforcing that because that makes uh, then the implementation of Agile and the ability to be Agile much more easy, much easier. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I guess in terms of um, yourself as a CTO, you've been instrumental from the beginning in um, in, in, in sort of forming and, and building a team that is responsible for uh, Curio and its application now. But what would you say is the, or what are the most important attributes of a CTO in a startup or, or your young scale-up company in comparison to some of the larger, more established businesses that you've worked in in the past? Um, you've got to be volatile. So... And to be prepared to really jump very quickly between different layers, uh, different level of discussions and decision making. So you need to be able to step back and be involved in strategic thinking and not really shy away from it. Uh, uh, really yeah. think ahead in long term. But the next minute, you need to be prepared to then jump into very tactical, very short term uh, 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 decisions and being involved. I mean, when you start, we're probably involved in development as well. So this ability to right. zoom in, zoom out, step back in, step, uh, it is super important. Uh, you can't mm -hmm. be right about everything. So it is more important to be volatile and really to be able to, uh, yes, to have this ability to zoom in and, and zoom out uh, over anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's really helpful to know because it's, a question I get asked by um, a lot of software engineers that I uh, that I speak with on a daily basis: um, you know, what steps do I need to take to move in from a you know tech lead or a senior engineer to to make those strides towards becoming a CTO? And I think you know, not necessarily just having your head down, focused on the architecture and the code and and what goes into building a product. Um, all that is great. But as you say, you need to have different viewpoints on things and be able to think, you know, more strategically, perhaps with a more commercial head, um, and that overall responsibility for the for the team. Um, and I guess that leads me on to my next point. I guess what, what tips or advice would you give to any aspiring CTOs out there? Anybody who perhaps is working as a technology lead or a software engineer or even you know senior product people that would be looking to make that move into a into a CTO position. Yeah. So I mean there are different paths to that position, but if you join a startup uh, at very early stage, um, I mean experience is important. Technical experience mm -hmm. is important. But uh, in my view uh, that should just give you the confidence that you can listen to what people say around you. So that's, uh, you can be challenged. I mean, at the end of the day, this is a challenging environment. This is a challenging uh, a mar market landscape. And that challenge, you will bring that back home. So everybody needs to be able to have healthy discussions about challenges and uh, not trying to be too defensive about, you know, you're not yet in a silo to make decisions about technology and, 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 and be tasked with it. So you if you join, that's that's all about listening. That's all about working as a team, and uh, considering technology as an enabler. Uh, so mm -hmm. Technology has no sense on its own. It is really enabling the business to uh, to grow, and uh, and you are enabling the business yourself as a good communicator. So communication is paramount. Uh, you know, sp spending time saying things, not five times, not ten times. You know, just saying it again and again. Be, be listening and uh, and be a great communicator. Yeah, oh, that's really invaluable advice, and you know, perhaps skills that certainly engineers develop throughout their career, some more than others. Um, and having that <clears throat> sort of business value approach in mind, and, and using technology as an enabler, um, a definite you know key sort of takeaway that I think. Um, yeah, any engineer would find really valuable. So that's that's great. Um, in terms of you know Kiro Labs and and uh, what what does the the future look like for you guys over the next sort of 12, 24 months? What are you most excited about? I uh, so we have just uh, revisited our value proposition. So what is Curio about? And uh, and and really our focus is on letting people learn and grow. So um, we partner with uh, various publications. 
uh, in the UK, in the US, uh, we've got the Guardian, the FT, for example, in the, in, in the UK. So a wide uh, range of uh, 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 trusted publications, and we convert that into audio format. So this is a new medium. This is something that, you know, when people think about audio uh, or audio apps, they will think about maybe books or maybe uh, a, a song like Spotify or a podcast. But the audio landscape is evolving uh, uh, dramatically. And uh, what, uh, what is emerging right now is audio becoming a platform. So you're not going to one app to listen to uh, books or another app to listen to something else. The emerging trend is to uh, develop platforms for audio. In the same way, there has been development for video platforms uh, like the Netflix, etc. So that's a big, that's super exciting for us because we are right into the development and the emergence of um, <clears throat> of, of, of this trend. And so our focus mm-hmm. is really on understanding our users. Uh, we've got users all across the world, uh, and obviously the listening habits, the taste is very different. Uh, for someone living in uh, in Vietnam or someone living in France or in the UK. So understanding yeah. different habits, uh, what people like, uh, is super important. But we know that what pe- the main motivation for people f- to use our app is really to help them grow uh, personally yeah. and, uh, and to find out about new topics of interest and uh, information that may not be available somewhere else. Yeah, no, absolutely, definitely. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I can see why it's got the global appeal because everybody's looking to, uh, you know, kind of get faster access to information that they want, uh, access to the information more quickly, and 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 through whatever medium is you know suits them. Yeah. Um, in terms of, um, might be a bit of a strange question, I guess, but in terms of the publications and the um, uh, sort of papers, news news outlets that you partner with. Do they generally tend to be sort of weekly and, and monthly uh, publications, uh, as opposed to you know, how quickly or easy is it is is it to regurgitate this information on a daily basis and convert it into audio format? How how does that tend to look? So yes, we are focusing right now on on long piece, so of audio, so something that you can listen to now or can listen to in twenty days. There is this whole. Um, uh, um, so if you're interested in a topic, for example, what you may be interested in is finding different angles to the topic and how it is being presented. So that's super important for us to correct a certain type of content, yeah. which is long-lived. Um, so yes, yeah, so the correction process is actually quite fast. Uh, so yeah. we have got some content which is quite amusing uh, in some instance, but what we found is the news content it was it is what people what is bringing people in for the first time. They start using Curio a, a lot for what could be considered a bit as a newsy, but as they start using it more, then they start digging into more into topics in more depth, and then the uh, the, the nature of the articles uh, they they tend to listen to is more long term kind of content. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So, um, I guess if you're into your audio books or you enjoy your podcasts and you know you, you like your your news on the go, you should definitely go and check out Curio. Um, okay. It sounds it, so, yeah, it sounds it definitely sounds like something I'm going to be checking out because I quite like some of my international news. However, the mediums in which I I seek that out at the moment, I think are probably um, you know maybe a little one sided or something like that. So I'd be keen to get a a broader um, spread of, of, of news from, from a variety of outlets. And it certainly sounds like that's something that, that Kira will provide via, via the platform. Yes. Yeah, and give me your feedback. Always a, I will always have yeah. Absolutely. Well, um, yeah, thanks very much for, for joining me today, uh, Emmanuel. It's been great speaking with you. Um, and there's definitely some very you know important uh, learnings and takeaways for uh, our community to take on board there. And I really appreciate your time and sharing those.